Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Texas is proud to partner with the Texas Tribune to provide free public events like the one you're about to see. These candid conversations are designed to promote public dialogue and civic engagement throughout the state. Please join me in welcoming the Honorable Travis Clardy and the Honorable Robert Nichols. <laughs> sense that a conservative state led by conservative elected officials is going to remain one come January. Is that your sense, Representative? I think so. I'm expecting a red letter day red, on November 4th. Red letter. <laughs> I expect to see a complete sweep uh, right. of our party and see Republicans in the office. But the interesting thing, Evan, is how it's going to affect state government next session because we're going to see new people in new spots for the first time in years and years. We have years. really overturned the mulch of state government election cycle, have we not? And it's new people, but not unfamiliar people in those offices. Correct. In all likelihood. In all likelihood. People, there are people that we know, uh, and, and they've served the state well, but they're all learning new places. We were uh, visiting before we started a moment ago that, that there's a, uh, a learning curve for any job. Right. Uh, and I think we're going to have a lot of dedicated <coughs> people, both Republican, Democrat, rural, urban, working together, but because there's so many people learning, not just the statewide, but also uh, most importantly, the one job we do is to pass a budget. That's the right. one thing we have to do. Indeed. We have a new appropriations chairman in the House and a new Senate finance chairman in the Senate. And so as we work through that process, it may take a little longer. Right. I'm hoping not longer than 140 days, but people are telling us probably so. Well, the, the, the press always loves predictions of special sessions because it's good for business. But the reality is, Senator, it'd be nice if you all could get your business done in 140 and then get back to Jacksonville. Wouldn't we have, uh, we're going to do that. The uh, thing I'm focused on in your, uh, what you were comment about the election is we're going to have in those statewide positions all new people right. that have never worked in that position before that have never worked with each other in that position before. Right. And the one thing that most people are not really thinking about are their staffs and the policy people, yeah. the lieutenant governor and the governor. They're the ones that are working with the agencies as well as with the committees and the members on the floor on different types of legislation. And we don't know who these people are. Yep. I'm talking about the staff. Right. And we've never worked with them before. And so it's all going to happen at the same time. What I said about Shirley here at Stephen F. Austin is the case with state government. The people at the top get the credit, but it's the staff that does the work. And so actually knowing who the staff people are, will tell us a lot eventually about what it's going to look like. And the fact is, Rick Perry's been governor for 14 years. David Dewhurst's been lieutenant governor for 12 years. Greg Abbott's been attorney general for 12 years. When you change out those offices, you also change out the people who they, in turn, appoint. So Governor Perry may have appointed over these 14 years 5,000 people to various boards and commissions and state government and people he worked with that filter, or who filtered down into agencies. In theory, with new people coming in, Senator, we're going to see a whole bunch of new people running state agencies. That's correct. It's new, new staff people on those eight. So it really will be a totally, totally new deal. And I, that's what most people are not thinking about. And, but, but in fact, it'd be good to start thinking about that now, regardless right. of the outcome of these elections. So we, we know for a fact, well, we don't yet know for certain until Election Day how these things turn out. We do know that come January the 12th or 13th, you all are going to gavel in for the 84th session. And the fact is, you have served... A number of sessions, Representative, you're going to be in your second session. You know what the beginning of a session is like. It's chaotic. In the first 60 days, you don't actually do meaningful work. You honor the Little League <laughs> in Lufkin on the floor of the House or what have you. But you're going to confront a whole bunch of issues that are going to need your attention. And I thought we might begin, Senator, in deference to you, Chairman, with transportation. We have a ballot initiative uh, this November that would put a billion seven into transportation uh, funding uh, out of the rainy day fund per the votes that you all cast in the last session. It, does, it actually does not take it out of the rainy day fund. It leaves the rainy day fund untouched. A deposit is made once a year into the rainy day fund. Right. What it does is when there's an adequate balance, the deposit will be split. Right. So at the same time we put $1.7 billion into transportation, we will also be putting $1.7 more 
into the rainy day fund. Well, and in fact, I, I shortcutted it, but basically, it, <laughs> it, it, it is not. Com I think the point is, it's not coming out of general revenue. It's not. It was not Correct. something that you appropriate out of the state budget. It required a vote of two thirds of both the House and the Senate, and it requires us to vote in November to approve Correct. this mechanism. The fact is, the amount of money that is needed for transportation is quite a bit more than what you all appropriated through whatever mechanism you appropriated. That's, that's correct. That's we're correct. between, and I've worked on this issue for about 17 years, yeah. it's, we're between $4 billion a year and $5 billion a year short. Right. Uh, over the last 23 years, we have not changed the fuel tax. It stayed exactly flat, 20 cents a gallon. Right. Yet we're driving twice as far on the same gallon. Right. And we've had... Lots of inflation since then. And obviously the population of the state of Texas has grown uh, uh, to the degree that a lot of the roads that used to not be congested in the state are congested. And so a reasonable question to ask, Senator, would be, Chairman, if you knew that you were 4 to $5 billion short annually, why did you only appropriate $1.7 billion? Why not actually pay the full tab given the challenges we have in the state? Uh, there was not a single silver bullet to solve the funding problem. As a matter of fact, most of the legislators, we all have different areas of expertise. Right. And getting into the details, uh, the I call it the nerdy stuff, in transportation, a lot of members don't deal with that, so they're yep. not exposed to what the problem is until we hit the special sessions. Yeah. And so uh, the three special sessions that Governor Perry called uh, a year ago Transportation funding was in all three of those. And so we were able to concentrate right. for those three sessions, all the members on transportation funding, and there's been a, a, a lot more education, I would say, on that issue. And yet at the same time, while education was necessary, you didn't provide enough revenue by your own description Correct. to actually meet the need. But it, this step, Proposition 1, is the first, I'm going to say a bold statement, it is the right. largest single increase in transportation funding in Texas history. It's that big. Yeah. And it's not $1.7 billion a year. It's every year. Right. And so TxDOT will be able to lay out about $15 billion, $17 billion worth of projects. Yeah. Ten years begin working on them. And the members could not agree on the funding mechanism is the issue. It's yeah. A, there's a lot of good ideas out there, but getting enough votes for that idea. And unless you constitutionally dedicate a revenue stream to transportation, you, you they can't plan for it. They have right. got to know the amount of money they're going to have. Six, for a certain seven, right. eight, nine years are pretty close. Yeah. And you, you, that's not a budgetary thing you can do on a two-year cycle. Right. Representative Clardy, I heard uh, Senator Nichols mention the fact that the fuel tax, gasoline tax, has not gone up in 20 years. There are a lot of people, even some conservatives, who think that we need to increase the gas tax, given the fact that the gas tax has not gone up um, uh, in, in a long time. Now, when gas was almost $4 a gallon, a little harder to swallow an increase in the gas tax, I paid less than $3 a gallon here in Nacogdoches today. So are we maybe willing to consider the possibility, given the need for better and more roads and more funding for transportation, that maybe that's one possible source of revenue? That was given consideration last session, uh, certainly in the House, uh, that bill was carried by Representative Darby. It was looked at, but I think uh, what Senator Nichols has said is it, and he's a master of this, it's the art of the doable. Uh, and, and I do want to say this in all sincerity, uh, this is, Senator Nichols is, in fact, he is the guru of transportation yep. in the Texas legislature. I'm fortunate to serve with him because if I have a question, I just asked Robert what the answer is, right. and so it works very well for me. It's not going to work today. But what we, what we did, <laughs> oh, I don't know. I may be passing a few that way. Yet. <laughs> but uh, leap across that side of we, the stage. But I think where we are on this, and it is an incremental process, uh, the, it was a, a very successful uh, uh, bill that, that Senator Nichols authored and carried through both houses. Now it's law, and I am encouraging everybody listening and watching, please vote for Prop 1. Uh, on this election cycle. This is important for the future of Texas. Yeah. The next step, though, I think, is not to go to the new dedicated source of revenue. Uh, Speaker Strauss has come out, and I support this this measure. I think it's consistent with the conservative values that we have in the House that we true up and we look to have our budget reflective of what it's supposed to this be This is for. ending diversion. So if ending money is appropriated for a purpose, right. make sure that it goes to that purpose. But I noticed, Representative, you didn't actually answer my question. 
Do you, do, do you believe that we ought to entertain a gasoline tax since the gas tax has not been... I'm coming to you in a second. Don't That's worry. All right. do, do, you, do you believe that we ought to entertain an increase in the gas tax since the gas tax hasn't gone up in 20 years, but God knows the population of the state has and the needs for more transportation funding have? I'm open. That's why we have a deliberative body. That we have these discussions, we have these uh, uh, arguments back and forth. And so uh, I have not gone to this session with a closed mind. You'll listen. I will listen. I, I think that's the job. That's what the, the folks here elected me to do. Right. Uh, and act in a manner that's best for my district and best for the state of Texas. Right. Personally, I think the first step is the right step. And that's the end, end of the diversion. And then cover those other expenses, particularly with the DPS and the uh, uh, other needs we have that are taken out of those current fuel tax revenues, uh, that we, we replace those in other places in the budget. Right. I think that's the next step. The next step, which I frankly think with all the other issues going on, with all the new faces, we will be doing very well to get that done this session. Okay. Next session, I think, is when we look at finding a dedicated stream of revenue that will do a, 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 the, the next step, the next bite. This, this is the transportation is like any other elephant. Right. You eat it one bite at a time. And the bite this session is going to be into the diversions. Next time, we'll look at the uh, stream of revenue. We'll, we'll and then the after that, and I've talked with, Dr., uh, with General uh, Weber, the new uh, text doc, uh, director about yeah. this that that in the meantime that gives the the, the, the the department about four years to find savings cost measures to do things to find efficiencies within what they do to maintain and build roads right uh, and I'm really hoping we can can get there a lot through some of those cost savings and efficiencies which uh, new technologies provide so now senator I did not hear the representative take the gasoline tax off the table though I understand that he's not eager to, to introduce that into the conversation immediately the fact is you're talking about a need of tens of billions if not hundreds of billions of dollars to dedicate to transportation over a period of time to really get a handle on over this a problem. period of time over yeah. a period of time if, if we're four billion short uh, and prop one passes we're still almost Right, uh, a two and a half billion short per year. Right, so that's a it's going to take a pretty healthy revenue. So would you stream. would you would you entertain a, 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 an increase in the gasoline tax? I would not. And you would not. I, I would not, and I will tell you why. Uh, if you, it's a dying revenue source. If you take the twenty cents a gallon, right, that hasn't increased in twenty three years. Uh, there's nobody in this room that has a business if they have not raised their prices in twenty three years, True. they would be out of business. And so if you just adjust it for construction cost index, that 20 cents would be 50 cents, just adjusted for inflation. If you then adjusted it for fuel efficiency, the 50 cents becomes 90 cents. Right. And so you would have to raise it. So when people are talking about raising it a nickel or a dime or 20 cents, meaningless. forget it. Yeah. Meaningless. And with our projected fuel efficiencies are going to double in another 15 or 20 years. Right. And so you're going the wrong direction. What we need to do is find a revenue source that automatically adjusts for inflation, that's transportation related, that you have got to constitutionally dedicate that revenue stream. Otherwise, the budget writers will take it away. Right. That's why it's hard because you have to have two-thirds vote yeah. to get a constitutional amendment. And if we look around, is there any revenue stream that kind of meets those definitions that we're currently collecting? And the answer is yes. Every time you buy an automobile or a pickup truck, the sales tax the state receives goes into the general checking account. Uh, I have, for the two sessions in a row, filed a constitutional amendment, we call it a resolution, yeah. to capture a portion of that vehicle sales tax and constitutionally dedicate it to the road. Right. Uh, that, and I think the voters would vote for it in a heartbeat. Right. Connect, if you're without the road, you don't need a car. Without the car, you don't need so the road. So it goes back to this idea of ending diversions. I mean, it's not really a diversion, but it makes sense that if you're paying a sales tax on a vehicle, why not dedicate those dollars? I think it's been going to the wrong account all along. All, all along. Um, water was the other constitutional referendum that we saw pass last session. Uh, it is a more modest bite at the apple. I think it's a $53 billion. It was said a <coughs> $53 billion need over 50 years, and it was a couple billion that went into, into water into a revolving loan fund last session. Are we done with having to fund water, Senator, for the time being, or are we going to have to look at putting more money into water as an issue I next think time? we're – through funding water for the for, time for being. now, because we reorganized the Texas Water Board, right, and we now have three full-time commissioners. That have, they've now finished right. rewriting their rules, yeah. and we're going to have an opportunity to see how it works. Yeah. But the state, if you'll really study anywhere that you buy water, you don't buy it from the state. You buy it from uh, the city water supply, right. a regional water supply, a rural water supply, or a, 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 a 
water utility. Right. And so it's the consumer that pays for the water. What we're trying to do with that SWIFT money is make the process uh, less expensive because some of these sources of water like desalination in San Antonio or West Texas where we have learned there is hundreds of years worth of water below our fresh aquifers that can be de desalinated and used. Yeah. We need to help them solve their water problem right. or East Texas will have a water problem. Yeah. So let's help them do it. But Re Representative, I, I hear what uh, Senator Nichols is saying. We have to see if this mechanism that was established mm -hmm. by the Constitutional referendum works. But I want to make a, ask a general uh, question on this. Th these are significant infrastructure issues for the state of Texas. It's not just about now, but it's about also investing for the future. Roads and water, two of the many infrastructure issues. We have an enormous state budget. Why couldn't you all find that money in general revenue? Why did you have to dip into the state savings account at a time when the state budget was so large? Why couldn't you just appropriate that money out of the regular, regular budget? Well, I think you could look at the general appropriations, and, if, and you know this, Evan, that if you look at the state budget, approximately 80% is already spent before we show up. So right. There's about 20% of the state budget, which is discretionary, and that's where we have to, to balance those needs. Uh, we are blessed to be living in the state of Texas, where we do have a, a vibrant energy sector, which is providing the service taxes, which in large part, nearly exclusively, is funding the, uh, the, the rainy day fund or the emergency stabilization fund. So it seems prudent to me when you have a, 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 a great surplus in that account. I think, in my opinion, that balance should be somewhere six to eight billion. Yeah. That's what gives us the best bond ratings for the state that allows us to, to borrow appropriately. But that money does not need to pile up and go unused. The whole point of having collections to come into the state is to invest in the future and infrastructure is where we do it. So right. uh, we were not compelled. We did not have to make the hard choice of what programs do we cut. You uh, had this other I, source I, of money available. And I will say this, this the, the members that served in the session before me, and, and Senator Nichols went through this certainly, uh, they're, they're, they just come off a very tough session mm -hmm. of tough budget cuts. And I didn't uh, sense a great appetite to do that once again from my the, the, my members that had served before me. Right. So we had, the, we had the benefit of a healthy economy. What we didn't do, though, was make the mistake of California. We didn't look for new social programs and new ways to spend money because we have it. We looked forward, what are the long-term issues that right. confront the state of Texas, and you go back 50 years, 100 years, you, it's water, it's transportation, it's education, and we chose to invest those funds, those surplus funds, right. into those areas. And I, I think it's, it's going to work. We're not going to have more money go to water. This session, I think, was the original question. Uh, we are going to see the, 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 the procedure streamlined. Yeah. Uh, as a matter of fact, a shameless uh, self-promotion. I think it's October 28th. It, we will have, uh, 29th, I'm sorry, uh, here on SFA campus, another event with Kathleen Jackson, one of the new water, water department board members, right, yeah. here to talk about these very issues with our, our local city and county officials in our district, and so that will be a good ongoing discussion. But now we're figuring out how to, how to move that money, how to place it, put it to work for all of Texas. So I'm interested to hear you say education, uh, water, transportation, you mentioned as big issues that are long-term issues, and so if you're going to look at how to take those rainy day funds, spend them on that. So uh, the Democratic candidate for lieutenant governor, Letitia Vandepute, who, again, will know the outcome of the election on November 4th. You may be seeing some of her in the Senate next session, actually, uh, as a member. Oh, she'll be yeah. Yeah, back, back she'll as a member. She'll be back. <laughs> um, she, she, proposed, she proposed as part of her campaign a $2 billion withdrawal from the Economic Stabilization Fund, the Rainy Day Fund, to subsidize community college for anybody who wants it. The idea that education is a long-term investment in the future of Texas, much like roads and water are, and you yourself said, Representative Clarity, education. Why not, if it's okay to take money out for water, and it's okay to take money out for transportation or some indirect mechanism yeah. to take it out, why not take money out of the rainy day fund to invest in higher education? Uh, if you're going to use it for operational expenses, uh, I think it would be a terrible mistake because it would be consumed in two years and you would establish a new I think what it would do is go to, it would go to, to, to essentially provide free community college for anybody who wanted to go. Which would be consumed in a very short period of time. Right. you be right back where you started. Uh, it should be used for emergencies. Right. It should be used for critical infrastructure. The two billion that was in the water was not actually spent. Right. It's very important for everybody to understand that two billion dollars is outside the treasury, so future legislatures cannot touch it. Right. It's earning interest. 
and it will be loaned out and then paid back to cities and things like that and paid back. So that two billion will grow in time, but help lower the cost of water projects right. all over the state of Texas. Okay. That is significantly different right. than spending it. Okay. Well, then let me ask about another budget issue outside of the parameters of the rainy day fund. Uh, you both know that, uh, and you talked about the way the budget is set up, a significant portion of the budget is spent before you get there, and then there's some that's discretionary. For a long time, I believe it's true that the largest percentage of the discretionary portion of the state budget went to public education. It has historically been the case that public ed consumed a big portion of those funds. But lately, health care costs in the state of Texas are rising to meet and will soon exceed public education as a percentage of the state budget. We like to be first in everything in Texas. I'm not sure we want to be the state with the most people who have no health insurance. But we have the most citizens by number and by percentage with no health insurance. And health care costs are rising and threaten to become the thing that consumes the whole budget. So Senator Nichols, last session the legislature made a decision not to embrace the Affordable Care Act or expand Medicaid. Elections have consequences. We have a conservative legislature. Peace. I get that. What are we going to do affirmatively, rather than just saying no to Washington? What are we going to do that we'll say yes to in the next session to solve this health care problem in Texas? Okay, I, we'll get into that. The, the, just because you do not have health care does, insurance does not mean you do not have health care. People can go to emergency rooms, they do all the time. We need to put them in other centers. Well, you know, that's the least efficient and most expensive delivery Correct. of care. Yes. It's the sense, and we all pay for it in property taxes. That's correct. And what we are doing, uh, following health care, I've been on the Health and Human Services for eight years. Yes, sir. Uh, and we are in the process, going through sunset right now, of taking the four different basic agencies under Health and Human Services. You have mental health, physical health, right. all these different kind of things, and trying to coordinate those things a lot better and get them more efficient. And so we can push our service level uh much faster in healthcare and, and those services. Yep. And uh, doing the Obamacare type plan is one of the most inefficient. You're talking about inefficiencies. The way our Medicaid system is set up in Texas, we're required to do processes that are terribly inefficient. We've continued to ask the federal government to sever us, give us the money, and let us go in and reorganize these services, and we can provide much greater service for less money. That is where we need to head, not just expanding a broken system. So this is the so-called Texas solution. Basically, give us a great big cartoon bag of money with a dollar sign on it from Washington. Or get out of the no way. No strings. Get out of the way and let us solve the problem ourselves. Yes. Why haven't we solved the problem pre-Obama? This, this, this problem of uh, being number one or near number one and uninsured uh, among the 50 states is not a problem that just occurred in the last six years. It goes back maybe two decades that we've been near the top. So Obama didn't cause the problem. So why didn't we solve the problem before you had the Affordable Care Act with all these strings? I wasn't in the legislature then. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's my answer. <laughs> Good one, Senator. Thank you. That was short enough. But, but you understand, Representative Clardy, what I'm getting at here. I understand that politically, the, the leadership of the state and of the legislature has said very clearly, we don't want to expand Medicaid. Now, we can argue about the particulars of that or the wisdom of that decision, but it would make no sense to, to spend time doing that because you all have said you're not going to do it. I think the focus of the legislature, most people, an awful lot of people in Medicaid are, are jobless. Yes. They don't have a job, and I think our focus has been trying to create jobs in an environment where jobs will grow and get more people off of Medicaid. And you, so you believe that actually a healthy economy is the route to getting more people the resources they need to get healthy. I do, I do believe right. that. Representative, I heard Senator Nichols say that uh, people have access to health care without insurance and that's emergency rooms. The fact is the uncompensated care costs in Rust County, the uncompensated care costs in, in fact, all the counties that you represent, I'm trying to not look directly at the county judge here, the reality is that the uncompensated care costs in all the counties are going up. And that gets passed on to all of us in the form of property taxes. You hate taxes. You are a conservative who wants to see taxes go down. Wouldn't the fastest way to see property taxes go down is if you all solve the health care problem in this state? Well, again, we are working to solve that problem. And I think the Senator Nichols spoke to several ways we're looking to do that. Uh, but I'm acutely aware of this issue. I think the, the presence of both of our local hospitals, Scott Smith and Gary Stokes, are both here. Uh, we're, we talk about these issues routinely about the cost and the inefficiency of, of, of uninsured patients coming to the emergency rooms. 
we are going to take care of the people who are the most vulnerable in Texas, who, who have to have the, that care. I think we do a, a good job of that, a commendable job. How do we solve the future? There's a reason we have 50 states, and there's a reason we're considered laboratories of democracy. And I feel strongly that Texans can decide best how to spend the money. Even a while ago you said this is a, a cartoon bag of money. It's no cartoon. Every time anybody gets a paycheck, look at the bottom line. That's their money that's going to the federal government that we have to beg to get back. But, of course, as you know, by not expanding Medicaid or taking any of the federal dollars offered to us in the Affordable Care Act, we're essentially sending our tax dollars to California, are we not? To the states that expand. We're, we're giving those dollars up. If you go back, I know in 2011, when we were having to, we were about $23 billion short. We went back and re-evaluated. I'm talking about the members of the list. Yes, I know what we did in the Senate. They were doing similar things in the House. Things like if we were going to cut back Medicaid. Yes. I mean, literally cut it back. Pretty good bit. We, states are not required to do Medicaid. True. You can, you can cut it off totally. But the impact of cutting it back 20 or 30 percent would push about half the people in nursing homes out. Out. Correct. Right. Okay. And then I got to thinking... You know, what about 50 years ago, we didn't have that pro program. People took care of their elderly. Yep. We have, by creating programs like that, what we have done is we have shifted the way our culture works. Instead of taking care of the elderly people in your family, which is kind of the way it was when I grew up, yep. uh, they're now putting people in nursing homes, and supposedly the government's paying for it through Medicaid. So you think that in the next session there'll be some affirmative steps taken by the legislature to address this problem? I think we'll keep chiseling away at it. Part of the problem is yeah. the federal government constantly changes the rules on us. Right. And, and as we have committee meetings, uh, uh, under after Obamacare passed, we had a joint Senate committee, uh, State Affairs, I was on, and Health and Human Services, which I was which on. on right. We got together. We got the Health and Human Services Commissioner, and we also got the uh, uh, Insurance Commissioner. And we had some specific questions we had to address that session. Right. And as we asked them, they, we asked, what about this? And they said, we've asked the federal government. They haven't written the rules yet. Yeah. We went to the next one. What about that one? We have to make a decision. Well, the federal government hadn't written the rules yet. And we invite the federal government to come to those meetings. They refuse to come. So we are trying to make decisions on a long set of things where they're constantly changing the rules, and they will not answer the question. And if that doesn't change in the next two years, I mean, we may very well have a Republican-controlled Congress, a Democratic president. The Republicans won't have enough votes to override a veto. It's almost as if, as if we should all go on holiday for the next two years not only on this issue, but on every issue. So if things don't change for the next two years because of gridlock in Washington, are we going to still be stuck in the same place? Let me say, that, that's, I think, Evan, why we need to bring the money and keep the money in Texas. Let us try to solve this problem locally. I, I would imagine there are issues unique to Maine or to Oregon or to Kansas, which right. we don't have here. We can tailor it better here within the state of Texas. But sometimes I think we get, get, uh, 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 we get caught up in, in the discussion of the money and the funding. One of the real issues we have in health care in Texas, and we're going to be looking at the Higher Education Committee, I hope, this session, is how do we, how do we provide the quality of care and the, the, uh, the people to provide that care? Yep. And in Texas, and particularly in East Texas, we are an underserved population in this part of the world. Not nearly enough docs and nurses Not and all that. Not enough docs. And one of the major concerns and one of the reasons I strongly oppose expanding the, uh, the, the, the Affordable Care Act and adopting that and taking the money was, we are seeing an expanding pool on the bottom, and we're seeing a shrinking pool of providers on the top. Uh, and first things first, we've got to take care of people. This, you know, money, we've got to pay for it, but at the end of the day, we've got to take care of our people. And to do that, we've got to have trained health care professionals. We have a nursing school here at SFA that's doing a great job. We just did a pharmacy school at UT Tyler. We're looking to expand the, the bachelor's degrees in nursing to our right. community colleges. We just opened a new uh, medical school in the Valley. Uh, well, we, we've had a real brain drain in Texas in that we've trained students in these professions and then not had the clinical residency places open for them to train and stay here. And the, the, the data shows that when they go outside the state, they typically they stay tend, out of the state. They tend to stay. So right. we are investing our education dollars to train right. the next generation of doctors to be somewhere else. And so I think one of the things we need to do is build 
uh, if it's a supply and demand issue. We yep. know the demand's growing. Our population's growing, uh, both the, our native population and the people that are moving here. We've got to expand the providers that can give these services, and, and we are, I will promise you, Senator Nichols and I share this, we want to see Texas have the best health care system in the world. We already have the largest medical complex in the world down in Houston. Right. Uh, we, we, we can do this. We have the right people in the right places, but the funding is problematic. Um, but, you know, it, it's easy. If it, it was easy, anybody could do it. But, you know, there are sound bites and there's sound policy, and more often than not, those two things do not go together. This is going to be a hard issue to work on, uh, but we will be taking that up this next session. Senator, let me uh, pivot over to public education. You were right. in the legislature in 2011 <clears throat> when the big cut to public education Correct. funding happened. Now, people argue, was it really $4 billion? Was it really $5.4 billion? Did we cut or did we just not allocate as much given the growth? I mean, there's... We actually cut. Yeah, I mean, you're willing to say because there are some people yeah. who will argue well, that we actually didn't cut. But I, you're willing I would to disagree say. with them. I was yeah. there. It was... I, had, I did the runs on the school districts yes. that I represent. I yeah. represent 101 school districts yes. in East Texas. And the best I could tell, it was about 3.5% overall. Right. If you take the... The amount they the, they have, yeah. the taxes they locally and the amount the state provides, right. add them together. Yeah, it was a, a, about three and a half percent cut. A significant cut, which is a significant, significant cut. Significant cut. So you all came back in last session, and people on both sides in your districts, representatives and senators, saw back home. Parents and other people interested in education said, "We need you to come back and try to put some of that money back in." The economy was better in the twenty. 13 session, and you all put back in somewhere in the neighborhood of 3.5. Yes, we put in about three and a half, three point seven billion dollars back. Not the entire cut bought down, but much of the cut bought. Down. Yeah, but we're still not there. Still not uh, there. We would like there are a number of us who would like to go into this session. Yeah. Trying to totally redo public education funding right. because I, I agree with the court that it is unfair. You but, agree with the court. I agree. You with agree the with Judge Deets in Austin on um, part of it, on, right. on the unfairness part. Right. I thought I had you there for because a it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you didn't have me totally. But yeah. <laughs> the uh, it's, it is unfair. We've got school districts that are getting twelve thousand dollars per child, and I represent a lot of school districts that get under five thousand right. per so child. Seriously below the state. Yeah. Average. And I just I have of the one hundred and one. I just it takes me a good while. But just before session, I go through all the counties, yep. and I sit down and have a long visit with each of my 101 school superintendents to find out what three things, yep. if I can fix, needs to be fixed. And give you a feel for it, all our rural schools, we spend a lot of money on busing, yep. a lot of money on busing. And if you calculate the actual cost to do that busing, the state only pays about a third. So the rest is coming out away from classroom money, yep, yep. things of that nature. And uh, and I was really kind of shocked because it wasn't an issue two years ago. And I've been doing this every session. But all of a sudden I found out this session, because of an action that we made in 2011 related to school books, now the schools are having to pay for those school books. Yep. And the, the school board, I mean the Board of Education, has now changed our books. And so they don't have enough money to buy these books. New books, yeah. And on, in some of these courses, the kids don't have a book to go home. Yeah. And the parents are wondering, well, I want to help you with the homework. Well, mom or dad, I don't have the book. They won't let me bring it home. So well, you think there needs to be some uh, yes. uh, re-looking re at school finance? Yeah. Our, we need to redo our way we finance our schools, absolutely. Right. Is that something you can do in one legislative session? I mean, that, that's an enormously complicated process. Yeah, but we are not going to – those members that have been there longer than myself tell me that we cannot do it until after the Supreme Court makes a ruling. Right. Because if you do, you're going to have to turn right around and do it again. Ju Judge Dietz, when he uh, pr provided the initial school finance ruling, Representative Clardy, said that he thought that the state may be uh, on the hook for as much as $2,000 per enrolled – public school student. There are 5 million enrolled public school students in the state of Texas. So that's $10 billion annually or $20 billion a biennium. Where are you all going to get that money? You can't, there's not enough waste, fraud, and abuse in the Texas budget. To, you're going to need to pass a tax bill if you have to put that much money. I didn't say I agreed with him on the, uh, uh, on the money. On right, the money right, yeah. And I would say uh, Judge Deeds is certainly entitled to his opinion. Right. And that this is be, when you remind us that he's an Austin judge, right? Yeah. He is an Austin judge. <laughs> right, yeah. And, and, uh, but but he, he, there was sound reason. I'll, I'll 
agree with Senator Nichols that he, uh, one, I do think that the, the trial got bumped back because of the work we did in the 83rd to restore the funding. I right, but he came back, but he but looked he at that back. and came back and said, nope, we're going to proceed with the ruling as I initially put it forward. And because there are certain uh, inequities, uh, and, yeah. and it's fallen out of balance from whatever it originally started 10 years or so ago. Right. So, uh, but I, I don't agree with his numbers on that. So here's what I think will happen. Through the appropriations process and the budgeting process, we will do our best to, to calibrate and anticipate where we want to be with those numbers, with what we expect the court to do. Right. Our Texas Supreme Court is a very fine panel of, of, of experienced conservative judges. I do not expect them to tell us how to solve the problem. You expect they're going to uphold Judge Dietz? I expect they were going to uh, address them. I think we will be asked to take a look and revisit the school education, the school funding uh, issue. You, you uh, think they're going to they, uphold? But, they, but they're not going to tell us, you need to take this money from and this sp account, and spend take that this money. there, and you got to move this. Do you think That's they're going to uphold job. Judge Dietz? I think they will uphold it on the inequitable part because it is an, it's not a fair system. Yeah. Uh, I represent a lot of school districts that are on the short end of that stick. Right. And uh, I don't know how any member of the legislature can look at it and say it is fair because right. it's not. And so what we need to do is we need to work to try to bring the bottom ones up. Yep. But, but I do think what we'll see is we'll get that sometime towards the end of the sessions, what I expect we'll see the Supremes rule, and then we'll take that up in a special session after we've had a chance to digest it, work with some of the other people. I, I really but shouldn't what, make what, vacation plans for next summer, what, should no, I? I can just tell. No, we're not. No. Um, yeah. but, but one thing I would like to say, we put money back into the budget for education. And I feel good about that for two reasons. One, I strongly support public education and then the 25 school districts within my uh, three-county area. But I think I feel very good about how that money has been spent differently than it was the session before. Uh, and I, I give all the credit in the world to, to uh, Chairman Acock on House Bill 5. Uh, and we reduced the number of STARS tests from 15 to 5. Right. Uh, and so the money now is actually going to education, not just teaching to the test. Well, on, on that point, Representative, uh, both... Uh, uh, Senator Patrick and Senator Vandepute, so both candidates for lieutenant governor, are advocating for that five standardized test number to go down even further in the next session, possibly to as few as one test. Do you support that? I think we should re reduce it further. You know, I, there's probably most of the people in this room did not take a standardized STARS test to get their, their – they, they took their classes, they passed right. the courses, they failed it, they got held back. So you think one test would provide enough accountability for the way tax dollars are being spent on see, public education? The, the, the reason we have these tests, I think, is to have an objective standard to see whether we are teaching well. And from my point of view, the, the test we had to show that year to year, the really the truly best apples to apples test, we have two of them, it's the ACT, I guess the PSAT, the SAT, and, 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 the, and the ACT. We have that standard to review. Are our, are our children getting smarter and right. better? Are we keeping up? We don't need to have these subtests throughout the process that really have hijacked the educational system. SFA began as a teacher's college. I've got complete confidence in our educators. Give them a free hand, put them in the classroom, and let them do their job. So you take it down. You know, Senator, uh, when the legislature voted to go down from 15 to 5, the governor almost vetoed the bill uh -huh. because he thought that 5 was too few. Now you all are talking about going down to one. I'm not talking about going to one. Would you not support that? Uh, here's what I would, what I do is I listen to my superintendents, I listen to my teachers, and I listen to the board members yeah. that are working on all those issues. What we did going into last session, after my superintendent tour, we got the superintendents together to try to work out what, if we're not going to do 15, what should that number be? I'm not an educator but I can listen to educators. They concluded it should be three. And so until they tell me different, I think we should take the five to three. I would vote for that. In but not go down below three. I didn't say that. I would then go to three, and we need to settle this thing out somewhere and give yeah. them some relief. I would be focused on these lower grades, three through eight. We're testing the daylights out of these kids and making them throw up going to school because if they don't pass that grade uh, test in the third grade, the fifth grade, they get set back a year. They can't advance, that's right. And, yeah, and so uh, I think we're over-testing there too much. It gives it, it's okay maybe to take the test, but then identify that child and spend more time with it. So you, them. you take your cues from your superintendent, that's what I'm hearing. Yes, sir. Well, but we also take our cues from our parents and from our school yes. teachers. Anecdotally, I'll tell you, Evan, I had one of our teachers uh, talk to me, stopped at Judy and I were at a restaurant, and she showed me, she had a picture, of, and she's a teacher, and her students in that class. And this question, this third graders having to try to over, overcome, and I'm not saying that this yeah. was it, the question was nonsensical. It didn't teach this kid the things he needs to be learning. 
Uh, and again, I'm not an educator. I'm not in curriculum. Uh, but I know we have bright people that are. And I think we do need to look, what are we trying to do? What are we trying to accomplish? I think that is to, to, to raise an educated electorate right. and good citizens that understand our country, understand our economy, uh, and, and understand that, how to move around this world and be educated people. Part of the other problem uh, that's been identified is they've spread the curriculum so wide that there is no way the teachers can, with the number of days they have in the classroom, to cover every item in that curriculum, yet the tests will determine whether or not right. they and pass them all. Right. So it's, it needs, we need to narrow our curriculum down to core things that are very important and let, give our teachers the resources and time needed to educate those children. We're going to go to questions here in one second. So, uh, Julie, we're going to walk a microphone around. Is that right? So we'll be uh, walking a microphone around. If you have a question for these folks, raise your hand. We'll walk over to you. Before we do that, let me just ask one last question. Immigration has come up as a big issue during this election season, particularly in the race for lieutenant governor, where it's been maybe issue number one. Okay. What practically can the legislature do in the next session that it has not already done on the issue of immigration, or is that a federal issue, and therefore, as much as we may rail against what the federal government is or isn't doing, we're really powerless to address the problem? Senator, what do you think? Uh, when you talk about immigration, people automatically think about people coming across the border as well. Right. And so, uh, recently, everybody's aware that we, uh, through the governor, we did the surge. Yeah. And what we found within the first couple of weeks with the surge, the sheer number of people actually coming over. And so then the governor then called up a thousand troops. Guardsmen, that's right. Yeah, yeah, guardsmen. And so they're down there now. And I get weekly reports of what they're finding. And that that truly is reducing the number of people yeah. coming across. Still doesn't solve the problem of the ones here. Yeah. Uh, I, it's, we do not need to expand programs to uh, like driver's license and things like that for people who are here illegally. Uh, I, that's one that comes in my committee. Yeah. I have people argue they're here. They may be here illegally, give them a driver's license, and, and that's, that's going the wrong direction. And so uh, there will be a lot of pushes to do those kind of things, yep. and, uh, and I will be on the opposite side opposite of that. Side of that. Represent. Well, I'll say, you know, first thing, we have to start with, with uh, controlling the border, securing the border, and we've done that. Colonel McCraw, the DPS, has stepped in. They had a plan before the, the, the uh, crisis hit, and so yes. that's why they moved so quickly. I know that the speaker had worked with him in his office and, and collaboratively came up with a good plan, and it's working. It costs the state a lot of money. I think I've seen estimates as high as $20 million a month. Uh, we will continue to shoulder that burden. It is a federal responsibility. It's one of the few things that the federal government is responsible to do is defend the shores and borders, and frankly, they're not doing it. So until they do so, Texas will defend her own borders, and I know I will support that in the next legislative session to continue that as long as we need to. I will say it really is a cost-saving measure. By not controlling the border, uh, you see attendant costs, whether it's health care right. or, uh, or in prisons or in our county, uh, in our county jails, et cetera, that it drives up the cost. So it, it's, uh, it costs us money, but it costs us a lot more, uh, and it costs us our sovereignty by not protecting our border. So we're going to do that. Uh, but I think one thing that we can do uniquely as Texans, uh, and we, we are blessed, again, to be in the, the now I think the third largest producing uh, uh, jurisdiction in the world. Uh, you know, we should all say a prayer to, to, to George Mitchell, thank him for finding hydraulic fracturing uh, that's allowed this new economic oil boom to, uh, to take off. But what I, what I would like to see us do, and I've talked to our, our commissioners about this with, with uh, Craddock and Porter and, and incoming sitting, uh, the, the Eagle Force shale, the shale play does not stop at the Rio Grande River. It goes into Mexico. Texas has the unique, if you want any issue of oil and gas production in the world, the expert is in Texas. We can export our technology, our know-how down there, and help our neighbors to the south develop that market, develop their economy. The best thing for Texas is a strong, vibrant Mexican economy with, with follows the, the rule of law, and we help them produce jobs, and we help our best, our largest trade partner have an even better economy. And you economy. think that, and actually, and that, that actually reduces the flow across I, our I, I think what it does, it would effectively provide an economic buffer. Okay. All right, let's go to questions. Um, Hands around the room. We have one right here, sir. My name's Jeff Fothery. Um, I'd like to thank y'all for being here, and thank you, Texas Tribune, for hosting this. Sure thing. I'm uh, representing the Alzheimer's Association today, and with 330,000 Texans living with Alzheimer's and some other form of dementia, and with the national and statewide growth 
that is expected in that diagnosis. Uh, what role do you see for Health and Human Services in preparation for this growth, as well as what role do you see for the Texas Medicaid program in funding the care for these it's individuals? It's part of the conversation we had earlier. The need is expanding, mm -hmm. right? So what do we do about that? I mean, obviously, this is a specific affliction, but what do you do to address this question? Uh, some of the things I mentioned a while ago, uh, we, uh, if we could just get the federal rules settled down, then we can tailor what we need to do in Texas. Uh, uh, as I mentioned, I've been on Health and Human Services for eight years. I've been on a hospital board for 30 years. And so it's a serious issue. But there are other ailments, cancer, uh, uh, very sad, very painful, very, uh, but it's growing as well as diabetes is probably the next. Yep. Uh, but the, the emphasis on mental health, I think the legislature finally uh, has understanding the needs for mental health. Uh, and we've been expanding some of those You programs. all spent a couple hundred million more yeah. on mental health so last, last budget. We want to solve some of these, but it's hard to lay out a specific plan while the rules are constantly being changed on us. And they won't even answer our questions. I know we've got some groups uh, and special committees. Uh, coming up with recommendations, and uh, we, when we'll be looking at those recommendations. Thank you. Let me, I'm going to try to take as many people in the time we have as possible, so when you ask your question, please ask a question, and then let's give them an opportunity to answer. Sir. Good afternoon. My name is Hayden Sparks. I'm a homeschooled student from Cherokee County. My question is about advanced directives. In Texas, hospitals are legally permitted to withdraw life-sustaining treatment from patients or even nutrition against their will or the will of their family members. Considering the value of human life, what can Texas do, what can you do as legislators to ensure that patients and their family members, rather than hospitals, are in control and have the final say in end-of-life decisions? Representative Florty. And Hayden, good to see you again. I appreciate that question. I expect this is going to be one of the, the, the significant social issues we see in the upcoming session. You do. Uh, and as we get into that, there are good arguments on both sides, uh, on different sides, different points of view on this. Uh, we've all seen the tragic situations, the cases back to the, the Chavo case, and most recently the case in Fort Worth. Uh, one thing you learn very early on in law school is uh, uh, hard facts make bad law. And I think it's very important that us as policymakers look at this. And, and the, this law does need to be revisited and, and looked at because we have, through technology, we're able to sustain life longer. But we also have to respect the integrity of life on one end, and, and, the, and, and so we, we look at this. Uh, I expect what we will do is get into it, and we will uh, go through this issue. Uh, we will, the first thing we'll start with the sanctity of life, and the integrity of life, respect for the individual. But there are a lot of discussions here. We, we, the, the extreme cases can lead you off into not formulating sound law. What I think we're going to have to focus on is how do we, fix the policy where it addresses those cases that are uh, most frequent or there's some certainty uh, where the wishes of the family are, are recognized and respected uh, and certainly respect those uh, directives that the, the person self puts in place. Most folks here probably have done a directive to physician saying, this is what I want if I get to that, that stage. So, uh, but these are uh, difficult questions. Uh, what I expect to see is in this issue, we'll see, uh, we will see our, uh, our doctors uh, provide testimony. We'll see uh, nurses. We'll see the, 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 all sorts of different specialties. We'll see ethicists. And we'll see folks from uh, from rank and file talking about what we need to do. But this is, you know, th there are a couple of model bills out there. They both have merit. Um, but I'm I'm looking forward to see what we come up with this next session. All right, sir, you want to jump in? Sure, yeah. I'll be happy to jump in on that. The uh, it's a very serious question. We actually did address some of that last session. Uh, prior to last session, you had a 10-day cutoff, and that's it. And we're dealing with, a, it, in the situation where you do not have an advanced directive, and there were several different bills coming through, the one that passed was the one that extended the 10 days to 14 days. It then also provided extra checks in there for uh, committees to review the doctor's uh, it, recommendation and to work with the family. It also put in more specific guidelines to give the uh, family more advanced time 
warning before the cutoff, and also to require them to help find a place for that person. And we're dealing only when somebody does not have an advanced directive. Yes. Question back there? Sir. My name is Jean Macau. Uh, I'm an American who immigrated here 52 years ago. And I got a question for you folks. When we came here, it took us four years because we had to get on the list, reapply and reapply. We did all the paperwork. We went through medical. When I came to this country and when we, uh, to get citizenship, we had to go to school. We had to learn the language. We had to pass the test. And for those of us that had to go through that process to see what is happening right now, it's a slap in the face. So your question When we became here, uh, we became proud Americans. So who is to blame? Is it the politician or the commerce people that's happening, what's happening on the borders? Who's responsible for the, the, the situation, the immigration? Because situation? those of us that came here from other countries. I'll, I'll answer that Senator, real go ahead. quick. The federal, it's the federal government screwed it up big time. They, anytime they want to shut the border down and only allow legal immigration like you came in, they could do it in a heartbeat. Federal government does not want to shut the, fed, the borders down. Right. We see it time and again. And so that's, if you're looking for somebody to blame, that's... But, but the, Senator, the questioner actually brings up an interesting point. The fact is the business community may not be with you in the main on sure. that point of view. You know, uh, uh, often it is said to people who talk about we want to have no amnesty, we want to be sure that only people who are here legally remain in this country. What you hear is that the agricultural sector will say, well, we'll have no workforce if that's the case. You'll hear other areas of the business community say it will destroy the economy. As much as we understand the rule of law and people being here legally, as a practical matter, commerce is a disincentive to, to put that kind of strict immigration law in effect. What do you say about that? Uh, I, I haven't had a lot of my business people telling me that. Uh, I think that's a false argument. I think there are some producers who try to use cheap labor and they use that as a, a, a way to do it. I have a lot of companies who actually, I have companies that do need part-time labor. Right. And they go to a lot of trouble to get the visas for their employees to come over from Mexico to work during that period of time and go back. So you don't think shutting off the flow abruptly of undocumented workers no. will have a negative impact on the economy? No, because what you can do, we can set the level, the government can set the level of, the, of people, the size of number of people we want to immigrate here. So they can raise that number or they can but lower they that lower. number. Right. But I think we're doing that now and the economy seems to be running pretty well. So, uh, but, but I would say this, it is a federal issue. Immigration is a federal, federal issue. issue. We get that. And they have not addressed this issue in a meaningful way in decades. But, you know, I think what I want, I think what most folks, people in this, the people in this room want is, I want to know who comes in, I want to know how long they stay, I want to know they left on time, and want, I want to know when they leave. Now, whatever we need to do within the industries, within commerce, to provide those right. temporary work needs, that's fine. And we can do that, but, the, but we've not had a, a national policy to address. Let me, let me ask about, just because we're on a college campus, let me just tie this quickly before this question to higher ed. There is a law in effect since 2001 providing in-state tuition to the children of undocumented persons in this country. You may remember that Governor Perry defended that law on the presidential campaign trail in 2012 and was booed at a debate. Yep. He recently said, and George P. Bush, running for land commissioner, recently said they believe that in-state tuition should remain the law of Texas. Dan Patrick, who may soon be your presiding officer in the Senate, believes we should get rid of in-state tuition. Yes or no on in-state tuition? No. So you would be a vote to overturn it? Yes. Would you be a vote to overturn it? I would be as it well. It passed in both cases before you all got in the legislature. So no vote and a no vote. Correct. Okay, very well. Sir. Thank you. I'm George Hugman. I'm a family physician here in Nacogdoches. I also uh, happen to be the vice uh, chairman of the Board of Counselors for the Texas Medical Association, with his, which is the ethics committee for the TMA. And I have studied this, these ethics regarding end-of-life issues in great depth. I'll be glad to discuss it with anyone. I congratulate the legislature on doing a good job last session. Your, uh, that was good work. I would, I would appeal to you to exercise caution. I don't think there's any way that we can draft a statute that's nimble enough to uh, address the specific 
patient counseling, doctor-patient relationships, the things that need to be done. I need to ask you to ask a question. And I'm that sorry. is the question. Yes. Do you think a statute can be drafted that's nimble enough to actually interject into that doctor-patient relationship to make that decision in the place of the physician? Do you think it's possible to accomplish what's being asked? I think in most cases, yes. But the, the trick is what happens, we talk about in the paper, are not those most cases. And so in those instances, we're going to have situations and cases that are going to have to be reviewed independently by a court of competent jurisdiction. We cannot solve all the cases in the legislature. We cannot think right. those contingencies through. Not every issue but, can be but solved. But I will say, I will be talking to George about how we draft that legislation. Sir. Uh, you question. don't want to put too much legislation between the doctor and the patient. Doctor-patient relationship, that's, doctors are trained and their patients trust them, and you don't want legislators getting between your doctors. Okay. We've got to stop there. We're out of time, I'm told. I want to thank Representative Clardy, Senator Nichols, and Stephen F. Austin University for hosting us. Thank you all for coming. We'll see you again. Thank you. We got to talk about a lot Senator, of well, talk about a lot of different stuff. Yeah, we did. That's good. You know what? The time goes by very fast. Oh, I'm telling you. I can say another couple. I don't even know what to do.